Sasori of the Red Sand, an Akatsuki member surrounded by mystery. Today we delve into Sasori's hidden story before he joined the Akatsuki. We begin when Sasori was just a ninja in the sand village like any other. However, he possessed a unique talent as a puppet master. His true passion lay in experimenting with living puppets. Through battles with various villages and clans, Sasori acquired several puppets, including one made from an Uchiha. But his ultimate desire was to create the most powerful puppet of all, his own Kazikage. The third Kazikage, known for his mastery of the Iron Sands, possessed unparalleled power. Sasori sought to obtain this power for himself through a puppet. Thus, he devised a plan to assassinate his own Kazakage. It was a meticulous process, taking months of preparation to ensure the Kazakage's demise would be unexpected. Sasori knew he would not win in a direct confrontation. Slowly, he poisoned the Kazakage's water supply using a jutsu to control a servant who would deliver the poisoned water unnoticed. The poison was so minuscule that it went undetected, gradually weakening the Kazakage over time. Unbeknownst to anyone, the Kazakage fell ill but kept it a secret due to his status as the village's strongest shinobi. When Sasori deemed the Kazakaj weak enough, he launched a surprise attack, kidnapping him without raising suspicion. Using more of his poison, Sasori rendered the Kazakage completely helpless. He then transformed the third Kazakaj into his most prized puppet, unleashing its devastating power against his enemies. Sasori knew that anyone who witnessed the third Kazakage puppet would not survive. This was his greatest secret, his masterpiece. However, Sasori was unsatisfied with the eternal life granted by his puppets. He himself would not live forever, unable to witness his art endure through time. To solve this dilemma, he came to a brilliant conclusion. He had to turn himself into a puppet. But this was no easy task. While the process of making a living puppet was not terribly difficult, transforming his own body into a puppet would require his death, something he was unwilling to accept. Sasori yearned to live and witness his art. Thus, he embarked on a journey, researching and seeking ways to achieve immortality. After years of searching, he learned of a faraway kingdom ruled by an immortal king who had not died for ages. This kingdom was known as the Coral Kingdom. Though not a nation of shinobi, they were formidable warriors. Intrigued, Sasori traveled to the Coral Kingdom in search of the secret to immortality. They weren't a country of shinobis, but they were warriors. They used chakra to enhance their physical capabilities and also create crystal-like armor to defend themselves. Sorcery quickly found out that the king was a recluse man that never left his castle. He tried to get an audience with the king, but he never got one. He was never granted anything in that country. They kind of hated him. He was an outcast, but that wasn't really an issue for him. And after being denied several times, Sasori was exiled from the country because he became an annoyance. It's at this moment that Sasori thought about a plan to actually make the king talk to him. It wouldn't be easy, but Sorcery had over a hundred puppets to his disposal. He just had to learn how to use all of them at the same time, because if he could do that, then those idiots wouldn't stand a chance, would they? Sorcery managed to develop so much of his chakra control that instead of only using one thread of chakra per finger, he managed to use ten increasing the number of puppets he could use to 100. And then he attacked the Coral Kingdom. This is the story Sasori refers to in the fight against Kyo and Sakura, when the 100 puppets managed to raid and conquer entire kingdom. The Coral Warriors were no match for Sorcery's ability to control an army of puppets. They fight gallantly, and even defeated several of the puppets. However, Sorcery scorched the Coral Kingdom. Whenever he passed through a city, the puppets laid waste to it. They leveled them. He wasn't even interested in conquering the kingdom or anything. He just wanted the information the king had to offer. When Sasori reached the capital, then he raided a castle the king lived in, and the king fought against Sasori. It was a tough, difficult fight. The king managed to take out several of the puppets and even injured Sasori himself. But at the end of the day, Sasori's puppets prevailed. The fight destroyed the entire castle and the city suffered the scars. Many civilians died as well as the warriors, that's for sure. Sasori got what he wanted, the information. How was that king? Immortal. The king told him everything. He acquired a strange looking coral in his youth, a coral that had immense chakra properties. He did so when diving to hunt for pearls in the coast of his kingdom 
and found this strange living thing, but he could sense the powerful chakra oozing from it. The king was a very curious man. He knew this was a powerful thing he found. He took it back to his home and experimented with it. The king then did something very mad. One could say he carved a hole in his thigh and implanted that into him to see what would happen. Nothing happened at first. Maybe he felt a little bit more powerful, but it was somewhat underwhelming. However, as time went by and the king saw his friends aging, he aged so much slower than them. He then realized it was probably the power of the coral. And then he began to train his chakra and his abilities to become a warrior. Soon enough, he acquired so much experience and followers that he took over the kingdom of corals and became the king. He would institute a new rule over the people and make the kingdom flourish. And that's what the king has been doing for the past 300 years or so. Naturally, Sasori didn't waste any time. After hearing the story, he quickly snatched the coral out of the king's thigh. The king immediately died. And the coral certainly had different properties that Sasori had never seen before. But just that wouldn't be enough. No, he needed something else. He needed to make sure his consciousness would be attached to the coral, because his body would no longer be organic, if that makes sense. Sasori only knew one clan that could have a powerful sealing jutsu to attach someone's consciousness into something else. The Uzumaki clan, of course, the best sealers of the Naruto-verse. So Sasori traveled to the ruins of the Yuzumaki clan in the land of whirlpools. He hoped to find a sealing jutsu there, hidden somewhere powerful enough to make sure his consciousness wouldn't be lost, whenever Sasori transformed his own body into a puppet. After digging deep into the ruins, he found a scroll of a jutsu that would suit his needs perfectly. It wasn't easy to learn, however. He figured those Uzumakis were geniuses in the sealing arts because that was tough. But Sasori managed. He used this Uzumaki sealing jutsu to attach his own consciousness into this piece of the coral, creating what we see in the manga, this weird tube-looking thing that's actually the only living part sorcery has. And he could use that living part to transfer his consciousness onto other puppets, not only his real body puppet. And after transferring the consciousness to this thing, Sasori used another puppet imbued with it to transform his body into the living puppet, just like he did to the third Kazakaj. After the body became a puppet, he put the living core back into his real body. And then we get the sorcery we know and love. The sorcery that transformed his own body into a puppet and that had to conquer, or more precisely, raid an entire country using his 100 puppets in order to achieve sad feet. Watch this other video right here, like this video. If you enjoyed it, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. If you want to check out the sources where I found all this stuff about sorcery, check in the description down below. Everything's there and thank you so much for watching.